Well, uh, welcome to uh, uh, the interview segment this week in Wisdom from World Religions. And uh, this week, it's my uh, pleasure to have as our guest, Professor Hassam Tamani, uh, who is Associate Professor of Philosophy uh, and Religious Studies at Christopher Newport University uh, in the United States. Uh, he is also co-director of the Middle East and North Africa Study Program Studies Program at Christopher Newport, and he uh, teaches courses on world religions uh, and Islam. Uh, Professor uh, Tamani is also a frequent speaker on Islam and interfaith dialogue and scriptural reasoning. He has received a number of prestigious awards, uh, including in 2017 um, the uh, NA. Uh, the NAACP Award for Leadership and Service as Interfaith Guidepost in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, uh, Professor Tamani is also the recipient of the 2009 Rumi Forum Education Award for Service, leader Leadership, and Dedication to the Cause of Dialogue, Peace, Tolerance, Community Service, and Understanding. His research interests include classical and modern Islamic religious thought, comparative theology, uh, in, and interfaith studies, topics that we will be uh, touching on today in our interview. Uh, Professor Tamani is also the author of Modern Intellectual Readings of the Karajites, um, the Karajites, excuse me, Takfir in Islam, which recently came out. He's also the co-editor of Strangers in This World, Multi-Religious Reflections on Immigration. And uh, Professor Tamani is the author of more than 15 book chapters in journal uh, and encyclopedia articles on classical and modern Islamic religious thought, comparative theology, and interfaith studies. Welcome, Professor Tamani. Thank you. Thank you. So today I have some questions for you that have to do with your areas of, uh, of research and expertise. And um, But before we get to the more academic questions, can you say just a few words uh, about your background and what led you to become an academic dedicated to your research topics? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I was uh, raised in, uh, in Islamic uh, Arabic culture <clears throat> where it's rich of history uh, rich of uh, of uh, ancient writings, so I was always fascinated with <coughs> with the uh, with, with the literature uh, and the religions uh, in general in the Middle East. Again, we have the major religions, Western religions, emerged in in that uh, in that area. Uh, so I always wanted to explore that further and further. And when I started my uh, undergraduate studies here at uh, the United States, and especially graduate studies at UCLA where there was a there is a center for islamic studies i decided that well maybe i need to explore uh, that culture further and because i speak the arabic language and this is uh, all these writings they are in arabic i believe that well i have the skills to do it and uh, this is, will be my contribution to the humanities so that's how i ended up doing this uh, this field islamic studies where i have a phd in islamic studies from ucla UCLA. And uh, well, good. Well, thank you for that introduction. Of course, that then leads me to ask uh, about uh, a central concept uh, uh, or idea in Islam. You write in a, in a book that's coming out soon on the mystical dimension of Islam that uh, Tawheed, and please do correct my pronunciation, that Tawheed, tawheed uh, is the sine qua non of Islam. And it gives, it, it gives Islamic civilization it, its identity and identifies its culture, tradition, and values. So for our, for our viewers, what is uh, Tawheed, and why is it so important in Islam? Yeah, Tawheed, uh, it's an Arabic, it means uh, the oneness of God, the unity of God, that, that God is one, and uh, there is no uh, other God that, is, uh, that exists other than that God, and that God is eternal. So this is the central doctrine in Islam, especially when Islam emerged in the 7th century, uh, the, the, the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, and the first teachings in that, uh, in that revelation is that there is only one God, and uh, that God is, uh, is not, um, against, um, does not have associates. So 
the idea that Tawheed also was, was important in early Islam because the society, the, the Arab society at that time, was very polytheistic. And it was, there, was, um, there was division among the tribes because tribes, they had different gods. And uh, those different gods, were, there were 300 of them, they even <laughs> entrenched that division between the, the, the people. So the idea of Tawheed is not only about um, people should believe in it. It was to it, it introduce a new system where people will believe in one thing that is called God, and that brought unity to the people. And when you have unity among the people, when they believe in one thing, when they have something in common, the barriers between the people are dismantled. Because that society in Arabia at the time, you have the rich, the, the, they isolate themselves from the poor, and that created uh, social injustice. So by, by having this idea of Tawheed, that Tawheed is very important, which means we are one community. And by being one community, then we have to care for the other. So the, the, other become, the other become the self, and the self become the other. And that's how Tawheed is linked to, to social justice in society. Ah, yes. Well, that was, that, that's, thank you for, for that. I was curious to know about how uh, what seems to be a religious or theological idea could be related to something with practical social consequences. Right. That's, that's exactly it. Uh, so again, it's a theological <coughs> doctrine that Tawheed, oneness of God, but it's linked to how people should be, again, should, should behave in society, how they think of themselves as we are one rather than we are different. Yes. Um, you know, I, 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 that raises the question for me of, uh, of a topic outside of mysticism, and that is this idea of immigration or immigrant, immigration theology. That seems to link very nicely into that. that that's, an, uh, that's a phrase that I'm sure many of our viewers have not heard before, immigration theology. Can yes. you say something about that, please? Yes. Uh, this idea, uh, immigration theology, we uh, published a book about that. Um, emerged at the uh, AAR Loose Summer Seminar in Atlanta a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And because of what's going on today in, in the world with globalization and the world is coming becoming closer, again, smaller, people are moving, uh, easier movement between people. So uh, you have the global north, talking about Europe and North America, uh, felt that they are threatened by people coming from the global south, those who are immigrants, those who are refugees. And then you see the rhetoric, you see uh, the anti-immigrant sentiment that emerging in North America and in Europe. And we felt that, well, we have to highlight, we have to talk about that and see how religions and their theologies can provide some solutions or at least discuss this topic to show that we are all immigrants. Uh, and uh, again, I want to give you an example of what we mean by immigration theology is that when every religion uh, emerged uh, with this idea of immigration and uh, being stranger. Mm. When Abraham, Abraham, the father of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, was an immigrant, the minute he became a monotheist, he became an immigrant. God said, okay, now you believe in one God, you have to leave. So again, this immigration is tied to being a believer yeah. and the idea of um, uh, Muhammad was an immigrant himself because he had to leave his town and and why because he believed in God and because he believed in God he was not accepted in his polytheistic society he had he had to leave again that immigration thing was tied to his belief after all Jesus in Christianity he came to earth he immigrated from heaven <laughs> he became a stranger here on earth and this is interesting, it's downward mobility, because usually immigrants, they move up, they want to move, yes. you know, improve their lives. So really, this immigration is across traditions. And then for people to say, well, uh, you know, strangers should not, uh, should not be here, uh, immigrants are threatening. No, it's we are all immigrants. After all, Adam and Eve were immigrants. Ah, so, that's, yes, of course, they had to leave the garden, didn't they? The so, <laughs> it seems like a rich, yes. Yeah, so we believe we have, again, uh, explore religions in terms of mm -hmm. what that they offer to, to, to the humanities, to people, to show that, well, we are all immigrants, not uh, only certain people that coming from different places. 
Yes, even when you think about the Buddha, the Buddha went from his homeland down to uh, Varanasi to uh, preach his uh, first teachings. Thank you for that. Uh, another central topic in your thought uh, is mysticism. And uh, can you say, what is mysticism? What's, what is a mystic? Well, mystic, I want to talk about uh, mysticism in Islam from, uh, from an yes. Islamic point of view. Yes. Like Islam, um, uh, the word mysticism in Arabic is Sufism. Mm. It's the same. Well, uh, a mystic or a Sufi is someone who, um, who believes that there is a true knowledge about God. And in order to uh, pursue that knowledge, you have to pursue certain uh, lifestyle. Let me give you an example again. I can explain uh, what, a, what a mystic and what is not a mystic. In Islam, you have Muslims who are not mystics. They are called Sharia-minded, Sharia from the Islamic law, Sharia-minded, which means uh, their, their job or this is their role in, 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 in this life is to uh, follow the teachings, to maybe understand God here and there, but not necessarily understand God, but follow what God says, follow his teachings as they are, uh, as they come down in, in the Quran, as they are in the Sharia, to follow that. So that called... Alim um, in Arabic, which means uh, knowledge. Now, uh, for the Sufi, the Sufis or the mystics, they believe that, well, it's more than understanding God. I want to experience God. So I want to become that. I want to feel. I want to I wanna experience being God. And if, if I give you an example. For the Sharia-minded Muslim who is not a mystic, uh, if you tell them about wine, they say, okay, that's explain wine to me, and that's how I understand wine. But for the mystics, I, I want to taste wine. I don't understand wine until I taste it. Yeah. So the Sufis, the mystics, they are about the experience. They want to become this, this God. So they, how to understand God is to become God, to, to, to annihilate the self in God. And the mystics, they're not about worship. They don't worship God. It's about loving God. Mm. And why loving God? Because for the mystics, they don't believe in this duality, uh, God and the world. God created this world. The mystics believe that there is nothing except God. Oh. And this creation is something that emerged from God. It emerged. And now the Sufis, they say, well, we want to come back, to go back to the source. So we were from that source, and we are that source, and we want to go back to the source. We want to be united again with that source. So this is the Sufi, they, they have this longing to become, to experience God, to become annihilated in God, to have this union with God. So that's the mystic, yeah. as opposed to those who are not <coughs> Sufis or mystics. Um, so a question then, uh, th there does seem to be some controversy about the notion of Sufism and some, some, some authors even argue that it's perhaps more of an Orientalist catalog than a category, than an, than an Islamic category, that it's not even a, that Sufism just names all pious Muslims, for instance. Well, yes, this idea of Sufism, uh, it goes back before Islam. Uh, it is, again, we see it in Christianity, and even it goes back before Christianity. I can try to, uh, to Judaism, and in Judaism now, uh, you have this idea that the, ma the master get teaching the disciple, which means this is central in Sufi teachings, that in order to understand or in order to experience God, you need you need this uh, the 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 knowledge that is called in Arabic ma'rifa that is di different from the knowledge of the Sharia minded, which means you know the truth about who you are that you are you are um, you, you have this oneness with God. So this started the idea that you need a, this, a master to explain that for you. Now mystics. Uh, for those who become mystics, they have to join an order. They have to pick a master, and the master will teach you. Yeah, also, you, there is a master-disciple uh, relationship. This is started with Judaism. In Judaism, the Torah was revealed. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. And the first master was God, and the first disciple was Moses. And then from Moses was became a master, and then he taught the Torah to the disciples. And it's until today, among, among uh, Jewish mystics, 
especially Hasidic Jews, is that master-disciple, master-disciple relationship, that's how you understand this world and understand yourself. So this is, again, I can trace that to Judaism, and this also, we saw it in Christianity, this idea of being ascetic, being a close to God, experience God. It was in Christianity, and it passed to Islam, and of course, it can be traced to Eastern uh, traditions, again, Buddhism and other, um, other mystics, who believe that there, there is this experience, the spiritual, spiritual rather than the the ritual, the religious ex, uh, uh, relationship between people and uh, and others? Yeah, right. That does raise a because because you quote also uh, Ibn Al Arabi and you, the, the doctrine of Huadat Al Wujud, and that does seem to be a kind of a non-dual teaching that has a lot in similar with say Advaita Vedanta in Hinduism and non-dual forms of Buddhism as well. That's right. Ibn al-Arabi, who died in 1240, he was the greatest master, Sufi master. And mm -hmm. he used this idea that Wahdat al-Wujud, uh, Arabic for uh, the oneness of being. There is only one thing in this, in this world. There is no God. Again, there is God and that nothing else. As opposed to dualism in mainstream Islam, there is God and there is his creed. Yes. That's two. So now for Ibn al-Arabi, he believed that's not monotheism. To be true to monotheism, there is nothing except God. Oh. Mm. To, to add something to him, to add his creation, then that's dualism and that's not monotheism. So that's Ibn al-Arabi introduced this wahdat al-wujud, that there is only one God, mm. and every, everything in this world is God. And this is supported in the Quran, where there's a verse in the Quran saying, wherever you turn your face, or wherever you turn, you see the face of God. Wherever you look, you see the face of God. So that supports this idea of Ibn Arabi, is that everything is God, which means everything is one. There is no creation. There is just one thing, and that's through Tawheed. That's through monotheism. Well, good. That, thank you for the connection back to Tawheed. And that also then seems to be the basis for two of your other concerns, uh, one of which is scriptural reasoning and the other is comparative theology. Scriptural reasoning is a phrase that I think probably many of our viewers have not heard before. Uh, can you say something about that? Yes, scriptural reasoning, uh, that was, uh, there is a movement today that emerged uh, again 10 years ago. The idea is uh, people from different scriptures, from different religions, they read scriptures together. So it started with uh, Jews, Christians, and Muslims who they meet and they select uh, verses, passages from the uh, Hebrew Bible, from the New Testament, and from the Quran. And each person in that tradition will read from their scriptures and they explain uh, those passages. And then they open the discussions that what do we learn from each other. So it's about, again, use reason to understand those scriptures, uh, challenge each other's, try to uh, come up with explanation of why things are written this way, not the other way. Uh, questions are asked, what makes you sad about this verse? What makes you happy? What disturbs you about this verse? So this is scriptural reason is to... It's a learning process, is to learn about each other based on the scriptures and to learn about each other based on what people in that, script, uh, in that religion, how they explain the scriptures to us, rather than we as outsiders, we read the scriptures and we just assume things. So this is what help learning. I see. So then together you can uh, learn uh, that's, that's what right. each other, what the scripture means from an expert who you're sitting and talking to. So I want to hear what the what the old again the Torah, how the Torah is explained by someone who is a Jewish theologian or Jewish expert or a Jewish uh, practitioner, rather than uh, try to figure it out myself. Right. So make the connection between the scripts, how they again the differences, the, the how they are they have things in common. So it's it's a learning process. Yes. So that would seem then to lead quite naturally to comparative theology. Uh, many, many, many viewers may think of theology as existing, as mostly a Christian un undertaking for the most part, and as existing only within one religion. But it seems like with scriptural reasoning, you could actually start to think about God in comparative terms or scripture in comparative terms. That's right.
and comparative theology, this is a relatively new field, and it's mm -hmm. uh, probably started by uh, none other than Francis Clooney, uh, who started to write about comparative theology, and he defined that term. So in the past, we have theologies of uh, religions, or we have comparative religions. Yes. And uh, in the past, when we talk about theologies of religion, which means uh, people studied other religions just to, to make an assessment, to make an evaluation. Mm -hmm. Especially here in the, in the in the United States, in the West, uh, 50 years ago, uh, the, the in the academia, uh, we studied religions just to assess them and to show that, well, they don't have what Christianity has. Comparative theology is about learning from the other rather than assessing the other is to right. learn is to go to the other cross the borders be in the presence of the hindu gods and goddesses be in the presence of uh, those who are practicing again doing B buddhist uh, meditation mm -hmm. and uh, be in churches and synagogue and um, come back rich with the experience compare and that's how you become more appreciative of your own or at least you have you have more uh, more knowledge about about the other and i had uh, i had a student who was uh, who was a catholic uh, and very uh, devoted to his religion he took uh, my courses on islam and he did comparative theology and he said i am a better catholic now he became a better so this is this experience is enriching that's that's so, yeah, is it cost? That's excellent to hear. That's that really speaks well to the future of uh, theology. That such enterprises are uh, are are being undertaken on a global scale. Uh, I think that yeah. Theology again, if you want to define it in two words, it's interfaith learning. Interfaith learning. Um, That's and, uh, can you say something about perhaps a, a way in which your own understanding of Islam has been changed or shaped by such encounters? Uh, well, it's, again, in, in uh, Islam emerged in the seventh century. Uh, in in when you have this dialogue between people, again, it emerged uh, in in the midst of a dialogue between Christians themselves, emerging in dialogue between Christians and Jews, and Islam uh, was thrown into this dialogue, and in Islam. Again, why I got into this interface dialogue, I got into interested in interface studies, because in the Quran, in the teaching of Islam, is that this must be pursued. Master must go to the other mm. and learn from the other. Yeah. And you have verses in the Quran where the verse is saying, I created you, different nations, different tribes, so you learn from each other. Again, this idea. This is 1,500 years ago. Yes. You know, God is commanding the people to learn from each other. And yes. that's interface dialogue. And in fact, the first interface dialogue in Islam happened between Christians and Muslims, happened in uh, around 618, 619, when, Muslim, when, when Muhammad sent his followers to Abyssinia because they were persecuted in Mecca. So he told them, just leave. They went to a Christian uh, kingdom in Abyssinia, and they started talking about Islam. So the Christians said, tell us about your religion, and they started talking about religion. And because, again, the idea is that because they wanted protection, they, they started yeah. protection in the Christian. And then they learned, so here you have the Christians learning about Islam, and the Muslim learning more about Christianity, and that was the first interface dialogue. So really, it's, it's in the history of Islam, it's in the scriptures, it's in the teachings, and you cannot separate Islam from really interfaith dialogue and interfaith studies. Well, that, that, thank you for that, that, uh, that uh, background, because it does seem as if that, that Islam is born as a result of interfaith encounters. Uh, as we come to the end of our, of, our, of our time together, Professor Tamani, is there anything that you would like to say uh, as a leading American uh, Muslim intellectual and ac academic uh, that could help our viewers to see Islam from beyond the, the perspective of perhaps journalistic and popular stereotypes? Well, uh, yeah, Islam is like any other religion. Islam mm -hmm. is, is not only a religion. Islam is a culture, is a way of life. Mm -hmm. And Islam is not, other, is, not, is not different from any other cultures. Now, the stereotypes talk about uh, that in, and this is not highlighted, this is not really, <laughs> not too many people know about, about it in the West, that Islam is about 
uh, first of all, justice, justice to everyone. Islam is about peace. That's the name Islam. It means it means submission, but also it means a peace. Now, Islam is about moderation, which means people in life should pursue things in moderation. Uh, to be excessive in one thing, that's against against the teachings. And this is the, th the meaning of jihad. jihad. Jihad is the struggle to keep things in balance, not to, not to exceed your limit in things. When you exceed your limit, someone else is going to suffer. So in Islam is that uh, the teachings, that's the, the, again, when we say it, justice is linked to Tawheed, is that uh, the requirements, people should care for the, the needy, they should care for the strangers, they should care for nature, uh, society, again, uh, uh, this, this world is something that created by God. And if it's God's creation, if it's God's revelation, which means it is, it is sacred, it's important, and we have to care for it. So again, the uh, cut the throat capitalism is, 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 is um, uh, um, uh, again, rejected in Islam because you, you do harm to nature. So Islam encompasses everything in, in life. Yes. To, and the teachings that to pursue moderation, and that's that's how we uh, we uh, pre uh, uh, prevent ourselves from destroying this world. So this is Islam. 